Now we are moving not to the strain, but to the rate of strain, change per unit of time of the strain. So in other words, now are talking about velocities, not about displacements, not about motion, about velocities. Velocity is important because in fluid mechanics, what matters, the basic, the basic uh, unknown is the velocity. So this is a subject that plays, has a special relevance in uh, fluid mechanics. When we talk about water, we talk about fluids. So now we are considering two particles, P and Q, at the present configuration. Present configuration. Q as a, at neighborhood of P, occupying positions P prime and Q prime. The relative position of P with respect to Q is the differential of X, X, small x, so spatial coordinates. The coordinate, the special coordinate of P is X. And now we're considering what are, at this time, the velocities of particle P and particle Q. Are those velocities the same? No. So particle P has a velocity, which for this time will be described in a special manner as the velocity at a special point X at time T. And particle Q will be the velocity of the particle Q, which is not the same as X, but it's positioned at the point X plus differential of X, okay? So, uh, the velocity B at this particle is not exactly the velocity of P, but there is a difference, which is infinitesimal because assuming continuity of everything, so there is a infinitesimal difference between the, the velocities of this and that, not the same, so, that is differential of B. So differential of B is the relative velocity of particle Q with respect to particle P. So if we subtract the velocity of this particle to the, the velocity of this particle, the difference is differential of B. So differential of B, that differential of B, is the relative velocity of a particle Q, which is at the infinitesimal neighborhood of a given particle P at time t. So that's what the, the, the subject we are talking about. Relative velocity of particles around a given particle in the spatial configuration. Okay? Where is this information? Can I define an entity where, where, that provides me this information along for all points of space and all for all time? Well, it's not so difficult. Just doing some mathematics. For instance, what happens if I differentiate the velocity. Now, I have, imagine that I have the description of the three components of velocity at point P, at time T. I could differentiate, and this differential would be the, the relative differential. Okay. If I differentiate any of these components B, the, the, the differential of BI with respect to X1, X2, X3 would be the differential of BI with respect to of XJ times the differential of XJ. Always, again, the summation convention is considered here, so it's a summatory here, okay? So let's call this part here, which is an entity with two indices, i and j, lij. So finally, I can say that differential of bi is equal lij differential of ij for ij1 to 3. There are three equations here. What is the compact expression of these equations? Look, now, this is the component i of a vector with this differential of b. This is, could be considered a component ij of a tensor, which is called L, and this is component j of a vector with this differential of j. So this expression, where j is repeated here, can be understood in compact way as differential of b equal a certain tensor, second order tensor L, that product differential of x. So finally, I can say that this relative velocity of particle Q with respect to particle P can be expressed as the product of a new entity, which is L, second order tensor, times the relative position of the two particles. In other words, if I knew this vector L for at the, at the particle P and at time T, I could just multiply by dx for all the neighborhood particles around P, I could know what is the relative velocity of any of these neighborhood particles 
uh, around P. So that is a entity, a tensor, second order tensor, which is called a spatial velocity gradient tensor. What, what, what is the expression of this tensor? Look, component ij of this tensor is derivative of bi with respect to j. That is it here. b times open product, uh, tensor product, uh, nabla. So I've just defined a vector which is naturally defined in terms of the space and time for the position x and time t. Define of the gradient of b, b tensor, open product, tensor, uh, nabla, whose component ij is the derivative of bj, bi with respect to xj, and the that tensor, if it's known, just by multiplying by differential of x, the relative position of two particles, what is the relative velocity of these two particles? That is the physical or the role of this new de newly defined back tensor, which is called small l. Look, why is small and not large? Because it's a spatial tensor. Naturally, it will come defined in terms of the spatial coordinates, OK? Because it comes from differential, a spatial description of, the, of, of velocities. So this is a spatial tensor. Of course, it could be just expressed in material uh, description just by replacing here the equations of motion. But in general, that initially, at least, that, that tensor will come in the spatial expression, in, this, in spatial description, and that's called the spatial velocity gradient because it's the spatial gradient of the velocity, right? So new tensor information about relative velocities is contained in this tensor, which, by the way, can be obtained just by differentiation of velocities of the velocity field. Okay, well. Look, uh, it's interesting for mechanical reason to decompose this newly defined tensor, the one we have defined, into its symmetric pi part and the skew part. That's an operation that can be always done. Look, if I have a second order tensor, look, this, this tensor is not symmetric, okay? At, that's something that I could do. A second order tensor uh, can be always split, it, split into one part, one tensor which is symmetric, and one tensor which is skew symmetric. How? Oh, okay, let's consider this tensor, and let's consider one half of the tensor plus its transpose. Okay? Look, this tensor, this, this operation, returns a symmetric tensor, because if I transpose that, I don't, I don't see any change. Okay? And then I could consider one half of the tensor minus its transpose. This is a skew symmetric tensor because if I change L, if I transpose it, I just change the sign. So, look, and the sum of this plus this, how much is that? One half of L plus one half of L is L. Plus one half of L transposed minus one half of L transposed cancels. So these are two tensors that summed return the original tensor, one of them being symmetric and the other one being skew symmetric. And that's something that we can do always for any second order tensor. And that type of operations we'll do sometimes because we are interested in this kind of things. We'll see why. Look, in that case, since L is defined as the gradient of B, L plus L transpose would be B napla plus napla B. And that is what we define, to remember that operation, the symmetric gradient of B. And that would be B nabla minus nabla B. That is what we call the anti-symmetric or the skew symmetric gradient of B. Okay? In that specific case, for, uh, for the tensor being the gradient of B, then the symmetric part of L is, is the symmetric gradient of B, and the skew symmetric part of, of L is the anti-symmetric uh, gradient of B. So finally, the tensor, the strain, the, the, the uh, gradient, the, the, tensor, the velocity gradient tensor, or the gradient of velocity tensor, can be split into its symmetric part, that we call D, and the skew-symmetric part, which is w, w. Well, that's just doing operations, mathematics. By the way, this D, 
will be a symmetric tensor, so will be d11, d12, d12 here, d31, d31 here, d22, d23, d23 here, d3, symmetric. How many components are different here? If it's symmetric? Six. That here will be skew symmetric. So this omega, by being skew symmetric, means that the diagonal is zero, and when I look at the symmetries, at the symmetric positions with respect to the main diagonal, the changes, the, the point changes. So finally, we have omega 1, 2 here, minus omega 1, 2 here, omega 3, 1 here, minus omega 3, 1 here, omega 2, 3 here, minus omega 3 here. How many components are here different? Three, okay? Look, six different plus three different, there, will, there were nine originally different components, so it matches, it, it fits, okay? I have no different components. The, the point is that I have split that into this part and that part. That is symmetric, six comp different components. That is Q-symmetric, three different components. So far, so good. Names, okay, they have a specific <coughs> names. Now I'm, we are looking, looking at the physics of this, of everything this tensor. This is called the strain rate tensor. Look, I insist in the difference of deformation and strain, right? Remember that the strain is just measures of distance. That we give, in principle, arbitrary, that w the name to that tensor is strain rate. So I'm just anticipating that this tensor contains information of the rate of the strains, of the change of strains along time. Rate means change per unit of time. So I'm not pro I haven't proved it yet, but I'm anticipating that this, inf this tensor with this name contains information not on the strains, but on the rate of the strains, okay? And that, that tensor is called the rotation tensor or the spin tensor. Spin means, I mean, rotation, right? So I'm anticipating, not proved yet, that information, this, this tensor informs about the rotations, rates. So somehow, this here, what, what we have here? I mean, relative velocities, right? And here, this tensor says what part of this velocity is due to this change of a strain per unit of time, and this one tells us what part of this relative velocity is due to rotation of that neighbor particle with respect to that one. So for instance, why the name of rate of a strain tensor to D? Well, I mean, I can do some operation. I just consider a differential of S here, the length of this at time T, and then I look differential of S squared, I differentiate, I do some operations, differential of S, differential of S squared is differential of X times differential of X, I differentiate first times, derivative of the first times the second plus the first derivative of the second. I just exchange derivatives, enter the derivative with respect to tight inside, so that's differential of the derivative of time. This is the velocity, so finally, I obtain this velocity, this expression, just mathematical operation. So now I replace here the just expression we have just uh, obtained, differential of B relative velocity is equal to L times differential of X relative position and I consider that D is one half of L plus transposed, I replace this expression into here, into here, I operate a little bit, I obtain that this original expression is differential of X, that multiply L transpose times L differential of X, this is 2D by this expression, so finally I obtain this expression. The derivative with respect of time, of the square of the length of this segment, look, Look, going back to the, to the original problem, I'm sorry, going back to the original situation, no? so the length of this distance, this distance is changing along time, right? It's changing along time because after a deformation, maybe this, 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 this particle gets away from that one at a certain speed, okay? What is the speed, what is the rate of the square root of that? Well, I obtain this expression. In other words, that tensor D multiplied by differential of X, right and left, provides the rate of change of the square of the length of the distance of the two particles. 
So that's why I call that tensor D. This tensor D contains information on the strain rate, the variation of distances rate. But I can go also go deeper on that. That is the expression that we got before, differential of length after and before the formation can be expressed in that way in terms of the Lagrangian strain, uh, strain tensor. I just differentiate then with respect to time. Look that this doesn't depend on time, so this differential is constant, so that differential is equal to that one. And that now by differentiating with respect to time, I obtain this expression. So I can obtain this expression and this expression, they are both the same. So finally, this operation said, tell me, tells me that I can express this expression. E dot, E dot, now the dot, the upper dot from now on will mean differential with respect to time, okay? So that is that says that differential of x, x times epsilon dot times differential of x is on one sign that, and from this time also that, so is equal to that. So finally, I have these expressions. I replace here the general, the, the fundamental equation of the formation, the one that relates position after and before the formation. I operate a little bit, blah, 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 and I obtain that. That equation is fulfilled for any differential of x, for any relative position of particles. Again, is like I told you, since that is any, that means that the only way of fulfilling that equation is that what is in the parentheses is zero. So finally, I obtain the parentheses is zero, and I obtain this expression. So that's, I mean, you can go into, look at that in details, but I think that you won't have any problem in getting to the result. What is that? Well, that is the expression that provides, not the E, e is, I recall it, E is the strain measure, okay? So you know what it means that contains information about variations of angles and distances. But how much is E dot? So how much is the rate of E, the variation with respect to time of E? How fast is it? Now I'm not concerned about if the strain is larger or smooth. I'm just concerned about how fast is that? How fast is the strain? One case is that, very slow. One case is that, very fast. So it's not the same. I'm just measuring the rate of change of the strains. That's one of my concern. So, is that expression? So, the rate of change of the strains depends, is contained of D. D, I recall, what was D? The symmetric part of that, ten that tensor, that tensor. That is, qual is, is why this tensor is called the strain rate tensor. Because it contains information about the rate of the Lagrangian strains, the change in time along time of the Lagrangian strains, the rate of change of the Lagrangian strain. <coughs> Look, it's not exactly equal because this F, this F in general is not the identity. So D is not exactly the rate of the Lagrangian strains, but contains information about the rate of the Lagrangian strains. Okay? Look at that. By the way, when if when D and E dot are the same, when F is equal to one. When F is equal to one, look at the reference configuration. So at the initial, at the initial time of the deformation, at the initial at that time, the rate of the strains, the rate of the strains, so the velocity of change of the strains is equal to the derivative with respect to time of the Lagrangian strain, okay? But after that, at a certain other moment, it's not like that, in general. Unless that F, F, unless that F is already very close to one. So in the neighborhood of the reference configuration, when F can be approached by the identity, then E dot and D are similar to each other. In other words, in small strains, in a small infinitesimal strain theory, D and E dot coincide, okay? Okay, let's now look for the interpretation of W. w. What is W? W, I was, it was termed a spin tensor, rate of velocity tensor. So I'm just anticipating that the rate of, of, sorry, spin, rate of rotation tensor. 
So the rotation, the rotational velocity has to be involved like that. Look, again, that is the definition of the spin tensor. It's skew-symmetric. Then, as I told you, I can always extract one vector, vector, which is called the axial vector, three components, omega 2, 3, that one, omega, minus omega 2, 3, two, three so uh, that one, omega 1, 3, that one, and minus omega 1, t, omega 2, this one. So by selecting that, I can define a vector, which, by the way, turns out to be exactly one half of the rotation of the velocity. That's not new for us. So we obtain the rotation of V, which is the axial vector extracted from this tensor, which is called the spin vector. So if I know the spin vector, I know these three components, and I can reconstruct the spin tensor. Okay? Look, this is a very important uh, item in entity in uh, fluid mechanics. Is the called the vorticity vector. We'll go back to that when we talk about fluids. That vector informs about the vorticity of the, the, the of the of the of a fluid. You know what, what a vortex is? Whenever a fluid and sometimes turns around him and that I mean uh, becomes for instance a danger for swimmers uh, in, in the swim in the in the sea. So when the mo the movement of a fluid turns to be a, just a rotation around one point, that is the vortex. The vortex. And in those, in those points where vortex happen, this vorticity is especially high. So this vector, it could be proven, it will be proven, that measures the vorticity of the velocity field. Okay? Look, in other words, it can also be proven that the axial vector, double omega, uh, vector product R is equal to the dot product of the spin vector times R. That is the same proof that we did the other day. Okay? Whenever we extract from a, from a skew symmetric tensor, we extract the axial tensor, this property is fulfilled. But this allows an interpretation to omega. What is omega in that case? Look, imagine that we have a movement of rotation around one axis, characterized by an angular ve rotational velocity, omega, okay? So how is the velocity field of a body which turns around this axis with an angular velocity, omega, in that way? You know, you should know, that the velocity of every point which is placed at a certain distance of the axis is omega vector product times r. So that is the velocity, by the way, this is a product of omega times r is, in virtue of the properties of the vector product, is orthogonal to both omega and r. Okay? So it is in the plane orthogonal to omega, the velocity, and it's also orthogonal to the radius of that. That is what characterizes a rotation vector. So a rotation vector field is characterized by uh, omega, a, a rotation, an, an angular rotation vector, so the velocity field is at all points omega times r, r being the distance of the point to the axis. doesn't matter what distance, because that result can be proven to be the same. Okay? And look, what this equality says is that this, which now in virtue of that can be interpreted as the velocity, the rotational velocity of a body with angular velocity omega, this vector, the spin vector, is equal to omega times r. So whenever I find omega times r, I can interpret, it, interpret this product as this one, which in turn can be interpreted as a rotational velocity field. A rotation velocity field. Okay? So now, let's go back to the beginning of everything. The equation that we got at the beginning differential of B equal L, L differential of X. This explains what is the relative velocity of particle Q with respect to particle P. Particle Q, which is placed at a distance differential of X. Okay? So now, 
then we have decomposed L into D, the uh, rate of the strain vector, and B and W, which is the spin tensor. Okay? And now let's go back to that and consider that decomposition and consider the relative position, the relative velocity of particle Q with respect to particle P as L differential of X, so since L is D plus W, D differential of X plus omega differential of X. Let's interpret this. What is, what is I, omega? Omega is characterized by a certain rotation vector. Okay, you can extract from it the rotation vector. So what is omega times differential of X? Well, it's just the velocity of rotation of particle Q with respect to particle P. That one is a rotation vector velocity. Is omega differential of X or, or W differential of X or omega differential of X, that is a rotation velocity. Okay? And that is that part here. That can be interpreted, this part here, is the relative velocity of particle Q with respect to P, which is that velocity, can be decomposed into one rotational velocity, so a rotation, plus the rest. The rest is characterized by D. D is a measure of what? Rate of strains, changes of distances and angles per unit of time. So again, this is allows a physical interpretation of W and the spin tensor and the corresponding rotation, uh, rotational uh, angle, double, uh, spin, um, vorticity tensor vector B, W, sorry, vorticity vector, can be characterized as uh, defining a rotation. The, the, the rotational counterpart of the relative velocity of particle Q with respect to particle P. In other words, particle Q, P is here, particle Q is here, there is a motion okay, of particle P with respect to particle Q. And this motion also implies a relative velocity of particle Q with respect to particle P. And that relative velocity can be split into one rotation velocity instantaneously plus one strain rate. Okay? That's what he's saying here. So tensor D, tensor W, informs about the rotational part of the motion. Okay? If there is no rotation, if motion takes place with no rotation, like that, for instance, no rotation, then we can say that omega or W will be zero. There is no vorticity. If all the motion is a vorticity, for instance, if all particles are moving that way, what would happen? That the, mo the motion would be a pure rotation. And then W would be large and D would be zero if there is no relations of changes of angles and distances. Okay? 